Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for your uh, welcome. Your hospitality has been wonderful. Your welcome has been warm. And uh, Carolyn and I will leave tomorrow for Ohio with hearts full of joy. I've been uh, a little convicted this morning in my personal devotions uh, in James chapter 3, where James says, not many of you should be teachers because we all make many mistakes. And I'm just very conscious that especially, I think, when as Christian teachers or preachers, we're seeking to do something corrective, where we, we, we think that there's become an imbalance and we're trying to, to rebalance it. There's a danger that we'll overstate things or, or, or say things in ways that really ought to be nuanced. So please do test what I say. Don't just um, write it down and think that's it. Um, test it, think about it, and it may well be that, that, that things need changing. I'll be very glad you can, well, please don't, don't all do this, but through the Tyndale House website, you can find my email, and um, especially the, the, the professors. Feel free, please, to um, uh, you know, have a conversation about these things. I'd be glad of that, because I'm always uh, learning. So I want to persuade you, if you're not already persuaded, that Jesus Christ is the sum and substance of the Psalms, and that only those in Christ can uh, pray and sing the Psalms in a way that uh, respects their true and original meaning. So that my first lecture yesterday uh, morning, I tried to paint in outline what uh, my understanding of the New Testament echoes and quotations and how, how the Lord Jesus and the apostles and the apostolic writers um, shape our understanding of the Psalms. Yesterday afternoon, I tried to, 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 to give a rather inadequate um, tour of 2,000 years of Christian history, but to try to, to see some of the things that have changed and, and perhaps to identify why they've uh, changed. I hope that was some value. You might want to call yesterday afternoon's lecture two cheers for the Church Fathers, but perhaps only two cheers for modern commentators and no cheers for the Enlightenment. Um, that might sum up that lecture. Now in this final lecture, I want to try to, to, to show why this matters and try to model this a little bit. I, I want to try to take one Psalm, Psalm 3. You might like to turn up Psalm 3 and uh, refer not just to that, but mainly to Psalm 3. I want to uh, touch on six brief theological reflections, quite briefly. Uh, I want to try to touch on a couple of difficult issues, not from Psalm 3, but just to mention a couple of difficult issues. I want to give you an, a, a, an illustration, a kind of sustained illustration that I found helpful with the Psalms, and I want to try to give some guidance for a Psalms teacher or a Psalms uh, preacher. So let me first read Psalm 3, and as I read it, imagine that you have been tasked or you've tasked yourself with preaching it or teaching it in whatever context is appropriate for you, and you're thinking about teaching it, leading a Bible study, preaching it, whatever it, it may be. And I will make reference uh, to Psalm 3 more than to other psalms. I've chosen it because it's a, a relatively simple psalm in terms of its structure, it's fairly short. Uh, and you'll be thinking, he's cheating. I wish he'd taken a more difficult psalm. Um, I, I just want to plead, there's only so much you can do in three lectures. So um, let's take Psalm 3. I'll, I'll read it. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Incidentally, I think there's good reason to take the superscriptions, not only as being part of the original text, but as being trustworthy indications uh, of authorship, where, where a name is given, and for the, the few where there's an historical note, as here, that that is trustworthy. And I take it, therefore, that the 2 Samuel 15, 16, 17, 18 background of Absalom's rebellion is the background to this psalm. Most writers in the academy, most scholars would not agree with that. Most of them sit very light to the superscriptions. Uh, there isn't time to address that here, but I think there's good reason for, for, for trusting them. And they should be read when a psalm is read in church for the public reading of scripture. Um, please make sure if you read the psalms in public in church that you read the superscription. Not the translator's headings, if there are those. They're, of course, those aren't scripture. 
but the superscriptions, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how many are my foes, many are rising against me, many are saying of my soul there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. So just hold that open if you would, and I'm going to refer to that a certain amount. My first theological reflection concerns scripture and the canon, and it's simply to reiterate what uh, I think I may have said at the beginning of yesterday morning, I forget, uh, 2 Timothy 3 verse 15, that the scriptures, which in the first instance will have meant the Old Testament scriptures, uh, are, are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It's simply to reiterate that. And if a preacher preaches Psalm 3 without that kind of reference to Christ, you want to ask him the question. I was reading a book of church history of a pastor in Lausanne in the early 19th century, and he used to hold seminars uh, for what we would call seminarians. And when a student made no mention of Christ, uh, in a paper, he would say to him, but my friend, what have you done with your saviour? And I want to encourage you to ask that if you hear uh, a Christless preaching of a psalm. Always it should, 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 should make us wise in some way for salvation through faith in Christ. And if a preacher says, well, I've just told you what the words of the psalm mean, so I've preached it, I've expounded it, you want to say to the preacher, no, you haven't, because the meaning of any text of scripture uh, is taken from its context, and the context of Psalm 3 is the whole of Scripture. And in the context of the whole of Scripture, in some way, it should make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ. It's a brief observation, but an important one. The second theological reflection I want to um, offer concerns prophecy and the Spirit of Christ. And it, it's this, being therefore a prophet, says Peter of David in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost after a quotation from Psalm 16, being therefore a prophet. 1 Chronicles 25 speaks of temple musicians as prophesying. Matthew 13 describes Asaph in Psalm 78 as the prophet. And that encourages us to think that not only that David speaks with the voice of prophecy, but that all the psalmists, uh, named and anonymous, all of them speak from God, uh, and they speak in the character of prophecy. That's enormously important, because it means, if, that's, if this is right, that it's not just the downwards from God parts of the psalms, like the downwards of, from God parts, you know, the law and the prophets speaking to us from God. It's not just those parts that, that are, come inspired from the Spirit of God. It's also the speaking up to God parts of prayer and praise so often in the Psalms. They too are inspired by the Spirit, every word of them I take it. So you'll sometimes come across people who will say that the Psalms contain all sorts of very human but flawed responses to God from people, people under pressure. So C.S. Lewis most famously in his reflections on the Psalms described some of the prayers for God to judge the wicked as, and I quote, profoundly wrong and that we should be wicked if we in any way condoned or approved these sentiments. That's deeply problematical if you believe that the Psalms have the character of prophecy and that every word of the Psalms, both the downwards to us words and the upwards to God words, are inspired by the Spirit of God, who is the Spirit of Christ. Sinclair Ferguson's wonderful uh, book on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit has a marvelous chapter on, 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 on the, the, the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Jesus or the Spirit of Christ. And I've often meditated on those verses in 1 Peter 
1, where Peter says that the prophets who prophesied, which I take it includes the psalmists, about the grace that was to be yours, he's talking about the salvation that we have in Christ, that they searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have been announced to you. Now apply that to the Psalms. And in the Psalms, the Spirit who carried along David and the Korahites and the Asaphites and the other psalmists and the anonymous psalmist, the Spirit who carried them along in their words in the Psalms is the Spirit of Christ. And therefore it will not surprise us that the words we hear are words which in some sense were true for the, for the original psalmists. They're, they're, they're not pretending, they're genuine and they do reflect the, the experience and, and the, the, the hopes and fears of the psalmists, but ultimately they, they are the voice um, of the Spirit of Christ. That would, it won't surprise us, I was talking with one or two of the professors just now, it won't surprise us if there's a certain indefiniteness there. The old saying that the furniture of Christ and his gospel is there in the Old Testament, it's all there, but the room is, as it were, darkened. And what the New Testament does is to throw open the shutters, open the blinds, uh, so that the light shines on all of that, and we understand it clearly. It's a great old um, uh, illustration. So take seriously the nature of the Psalms as prophecy. So when, for example, in Psalm 3, David says in verse 5, I lay down and slept, I woke again, I take it that was true in David's experience, that in Absalom's rebellion at a time when his life was hunty, you know, he was a wanted man, he lay down and slept because he trusted that God would wake him and God woke him and, uh, and sustained him and so on. I take it that that was literally true of David. It makes perfect sense in Absalom's rebellion. But I take it that it also has meaning when the Lord Jesus lies down and sleeps in a boat, in a storm on the Sea of Galilee, when all the powers of hell sought to destroy him. And there he was asleep in the boat, and he wakes again, for his heavenly Father sustains him. And I wonder, were the old writers, Clement of Rome, Justin Martyr, Augustine, Luther, were they fanciful, where they took that word sleeping to indicate death as well. The New Testament does, speaks of the death of a believer as falling asleep. And so they said, I, 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 I lay down to sleep. And they said, ultimately, that has its fulfillment when the Lord Jesus lies down to sleep, the sleep of death, and wakes again in resurrection. And um, I don't think they were fanciful. If you think they were, beware the Antiochene dilemma. Uh, if you think you're more sensible and commonsensical than the New Testament, uh, because something's wrong if you are. Prophecy is supernatural. It pre presupposes a God who by his spirit speaks into time a timeless word. I came across a lovely quotation from John Broadus, the second president of this seminary, attending a meeting in Chicago in the 1890s, dominated by higher criticism, so-called, a lot of skepticism, liberal um, theology. And at the end of this uh, meeting, in which great skepticism had been expressed about, especially the Old Testament, no doubt, he was called to speak. And in, after saying some polite things about Chicago and uh, his hosts, uh, it, somebody says all at once he seemed electrified, trembling all over. He raised his clenched fist in the air and said, but beware, my brethren, and eyes flashing, his face livid. Beware, my brethren. Jesus said, Moses wrote of me. Jesus said, Moses wrote of me. Now, I'm not particularly going to shake all over and um, clench my fist because I'm an Englishman and we don't really <laughs> do that kind of thing. But I think we could say, beware. Peter said, David wrote of Christ. Peter said, David wrote of Christ. Let's take seriously the character of the Psalms as prophecy. That's my second theological observation. Scripture and canon, prophecy and the Spirit of Christ. Uh, my third concerns Christology and incarnation. Uh, 
And it's this, that the early writers had orthodox Christology in the forefront of their minds. They were grappling with the question of how in the one undivided person of Jesus Christ uh, there could be a fully divine nature and in his incarnation a fully human nature. And all the stuff that led up to the Chalcedonian definition, they were grappling with that. And they were therefore, I think, much more willing than we are to see in the Psalms both the expression of Jesus in his human nature and in his divine nature. And they grappled with that. Sometimes, no doubt, they got it wrong, but they grappled with it. And in particular, uh, I, I wonder if in some of, I don't know whether this is true of your circles, it's certainly true of my circles, that they, they took more seriously than we do the human nature of Jesus. I've heard a, a number of sermons in which uh, in the Old Testament in which there's not really any reference to Christ except that Christ gets sort of lumped in with God and the, the preacher will say at some point of course for us as Christians you know God includes Jesus or something slightly loose like that and it feels as though that Jesus has been sort of slightly arbitrarily snuck in with no, um, uh, no, no inner coherence or, or logic and we're just saying, well, for Christians, of course, you know, Jesus, we want to include Jesus in there. And you, you want to say, why? And I think part of the answer is to take seriously the humanity of the Lord Jesus. So you ask, where is Jesus in Psalm 3? Is Jesus simply the second person of the Trinitarian God to whom David prays? And in one sense, I guess it's true he is. Whether David understood all that I, I, or not, I don't know. But... It, it, in a much more natural sense, Jesus is the one who prays the psalm with the loud cries and tears of Hebrews 5. He's the one, he's great David's greater son, who in his real and full humanity feels the pressure and cries for rescue. And I think that makes it a much more um, coherent Christology somehow. So I leave that with you for you to, 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 to think about. The fourth uh, theological uh, reflection I want to offer concerns prayer and spirituality. We live in a strangely bifurcated age in which aggressive atheism co coexists with a resurgence of spirituality. Richard Dawkins and Oprah Winfrey. You know, they're both there, aren't they, in our, in our culture. And when somebody wants to nourish the spiritual side of their, their life, Quite often the Psalms get a look in, especially, of course, Psalm 23. All sorts of non-Christians will say, I love Psalm 23, the calm beauty of the words, it's balm to my soul. He leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul. I just love it. And when an unbeliever says that, they probably don't realize that what they're saying goes back to the German skeptic J.G. Herder in his book at the end of the 18th century, the 1780s, The Spirit of Hebrew Poetry, in which he begins to say that the Psalms reconnect humankind with our human feelings. And that romanticism, that German romanticism, has since become, they've gone mainstream really in, in a lot of our culture of spirituality. And when somebody says that I want to put them in an icy shower, and I want to say to them, you need to understand that without Christ, all prayer and praise is meaningless and invalid. That, that there's a real deep sense in which God the Father has only ever listened to one man. There's only one man whose prayer has ever been heard by rights. There's only one man who can stand at the grave of Lazarus in John 11 and say, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me. It's extraordinary comment, just a thing for a human being to say. And I think there's a deep sense in which all prayer, both before Christ and after Christ, only reaches the Father uh, because of Christ and in Christ and in his name, in a, in a deep um, sense. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a wonderful little section. He says, it's a dangerous error, very widespread amongst Christians, um, to imagine that it's natural for the heart to pray. He says, we then confuse wishing, hoping, sighing, lamenting, rejoicing, all of which the heart can certainly do on its own. We can do all those things. We confuse that with praying. But he, he makes the point that praying 
can only be done in and through Christ. And there's something very, very profound there and very deep. I haven't got time to sort of try and open up the um, theology of prayer that lies behind that. But it's very important for us, I think, to, 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 to insist and to argue and to teach that the Psalms are not a general spirituality to help people feel human. The Psalms are valid only in Christ. And it's only in Christ that our prayers are heard. And it's only in Christ that our praises are heard. And, and, and it's a robustly Christ-centered understanding there. That's my fourth. I'm sorry these are very brief, but I want to have time to do a little bit of exposition of the psalm um, itself. Here's my fifth. My fifth reflection concerns gospel and law. And uh, I want to leave Psalm 3 for a moment and just go back to Psalm 1. You may remember that yesterday I asked the question, who is the blessed man of Psalm 1? You know Psalm 1, the blessed man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked and stand in the way of sinners and sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and he meditates on it day and night. And he's like a tree planted by streams of water and all that he does prospers. And the question is, who is this blessed man? Now, quite often when you read um, more recent commentaries, they will say, well, Psalm 1 is a wisdom psalm. It sets before us two ways to live. There's a wise way to live, like the blessed man. There's a foolish way to live, like the, the, the wicked. Don't live the way of the wicked because you'll be blown away in the, the judgment like chaff. Um, live the way of the wise man. Now, I, I think that's certainly true, but I think it's a little bit dangerous because it seems to me that the proper first response to Psalm 1 is not to read the blessed man and think, well, obviously, it's not to think like the Pharisee. I thank God that I'm not like other men. I'm, like, I'm the man of Psalm 1. I mean, obviously, that won't do. Nor, I think, is it to, to read the, the man of Psalm 1 and to say, well, I'm not the man of Psalm 1, but I'm jolly well going to try. <laughs> Psalm 1 is going to be my motto for 2019. And by the end of 2019, I should have done it. By the time the fall is over, I'll have got there. That won't do either, because there's no gospel in that. And it seems to me the... the, 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 the the right response to Psalm 1, the first response, is despair. Is to read this description of blessedness and say, I believe it's true that only the one who doesn't walk in the way of sinners, and, 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 and the way of the counsel of the wicked and so on, this man, uh, this is the only way of blessedness, but it's not me, and it's never going to be me but by nature. I won't do it, I haven't done it, I can't do it, and I despair. It's very Lutheran, really, that kind of... Anfechtung, that, 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 that crisis of the soul, that despair. And then you look at it, and I can't do all the exegetical work now, but you see the connection between Psalm 1, the blessed man, and Psalm 2, the king in David's line. There are all sorts of connections between those two psalms at the beginning of the Psalter. And you look at Deuteronomy 17, the law of the king, uh, the king, when you get a king, he's, he's to write the, the Torah out, he's to write the law out, he's to write it out and live by it. He's, in other words, the king of Psalm 2 is to be a Psalm 1 man. And you see in the Old Testament, none of the kings was a Psalm 1 man. And you think he's the one. And thank God there is. There is one Psalm 2 king who is a Psalm 1 man, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one blessed man. And all blessedness is found in him. And then you read Psalm 1 and you say to yourself, blessedness is found in Christ. I despaired by nature, but I can see that in Christ that blessedness is mine. And then, by the Spirit of Christ, that psalm becomes my psalm. And I begin to resolve not to walk in the counsel of the wicked, not to stand in the way of sinners, not to sit in the seat of scoffers. I begin to resolve by the Spirit of God to delight in the law of, of, of God and to trust that in the end there will be a prosperity that comes from that. So it will be my psalm and your psalm, but only in Christ. And I think there's a real sense in which when Christ is um, eclipsed from the psalms, um, even if Christian truth is implicit, Psalms preaching and psalms singing can 
default towards moralism. So the, it, can, it can become, uh, here's the way to live, try harder. Or the psalmist says, I'm going to praise God. You jolly well need to praise God. Try harder to do that. And, 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 and some writers were, if you pushed them, if you had them here, if you had Calvin here and you said to him, how are you going to do Psalm 1? Because he talks about Psalm 1 as talking about the duty of a godly man. And if Calvin were here and we said, okay, it's duty, that sounds a bit like moralism, Calvin would of course say, no, no, it's only by grace and by the Spirit that, that, that you can do that. But my point is that if we don't make Christ explicit, people will hear it as moralism. You make Christ explicit and the gospel is front and center. So there's, there's my fifth theological um, uh, suggestion. Here's the sixth, the final of one of my theological reflections, and it's ecclesiological. It's about the church. When I, um, I sometimes I sound like a cracked record when I'm doing this Psalms and Christ thing, and I, I, quite often I get pushback uh, from devout Christians, especially of my sort of generation, who've loved the Psalms for many, many years. And, and they hear this, this um, okay, you can't sing them, it's difficult, it's only Christ who, who, who really fits with the Psalms and can sing them. And they get quite cross, and, 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 and they say, I treasure the Psalms. I've, I've read Psalms 23 at, at the bedside of, of somebody dear to me as they were dying. The Psalms are precious to me, and it feels to me as though you are taking the Psalms away from me, and you're saying it can only be Christ who sings them. And if I have been heard to say that, that may well be my fault. It's not what I mean to say, uh, because just have a look at Psalm 3, and I want to try to help us with this, because this is really important. Psalm 3... Let's just track through a little bit of the, 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 the psalm. Verses 1 and 2, David the king experiences pressure. And there's a crescendo, how many are my foes in the first line, but they're sort of static, they're there. Then in the second line, they're not just static, they're rising against me, and you feel the beginnings of a crescendo of, of threat. But the climax is in verse 2, many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. They said that of David, God's not going to rescue you. They said that supremely of Jesus. Let him come down from the cross, you know, if God cares about him, but of course he doesn't. God's not going to rescue him. So there's the pressure on the king in verses 1 and 2. I'll come back to that. Then in verses 3 and 4, David holds on to the promise of the covenant. So verse 3, but you, O Lord, the covenant God, Lord in capital letters in our translation, you, O Lord, the covenant God, you are a shield about me, my glory, the one who lifts up my head, which I take it is an image of victory and triumph, the bowed head being an image of defeat and shame. You're the one who gives me victory. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I was reading one very popular modern uh, commentator on this psalm, and he said something rather like this. He said, of course, you need to understand that you're not David, but your experience might be a bit like David, so pray it anyway. I don't think that will do. David is praying, he answered me from his holy hill. And you look back at Psalm 2, verse 6, and you see the holy hill. As for me, says the Lord, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So what is the holy hill? The holy hill is Zion. He answered me from his holy hill means he answered me on the basis of the covenant of 2 Samuel 7, the covenant that God made with the king, with David and and. and uh, David's line. That's where the answer came from. And the confidence that the king has in verses 3 and 4 is the confidence of the covenant promise of God. David is not just saying, I'm rather hoping you'll be a shield and lift my head in victory and 
answer me and, you know, maybe things will turn out all right. Uh, He's saying, you've made a covenant with me, and I'm claiming the promise of the covenant. That's what lies, I think, behind verses 3 and 4. He's claiming the promise of the covenant. And then in, uh, 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 and that covenant promise finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The Father has said to Jesus at his baptism, you're my son, echoing Psalm 2. You're my son, you're in covenant with me, you're the king, you're my son. He's the eternal son um, in, in eternity. But now in history, he's the son in history, he's the, he's the covenant son in covenant relationship with God as his father. And on the basis of that covenant, Jesus can pray, verse says 3 and 4, to his father, Father, you're a shield about me, you're my glory, you're the one who's going to lift up my head. I cried to you. Again, the loud cries and tears of Hebrews 5, verse 7, he answered me from his holy hill on the basis of that covenant. That's the confidence of the covenant for the king. And then in verses 5 and 6, there's a tremendous subjective appropriation of that objective promise. I lay down and slept. I take it with David. That was just what it was. I mean, sleep is the first casualty, isn't it, of anxiety and fear. It's the last thing you're going to do. You're going to do everything you can to stay awake. Now, I was trying to have a little sleep this afternoon. And I was trying to have half half an hour's sleep, and the the fire alarm went off in the legacy (laughs) centre. Oh, boy, that's a loud alarm. You'd have to be dead to sleep through that. (laughs) But David lies down and sleeps, doesn't he? He trusts uh, the promise of the covenant, and he wakes again. The Lord sustains him. And he says, I'm not going to be afraid, verse 6, of many thousands of people. You see the many of verses 1 and 2. Many, many, many. I'm not going to be afraid of many thousands of people. They're still there. Nothing has changed in David's circumstances. He's still got these many thousands of people against him. But I'm not going to be afraid. They've set themselves against me all around. You get the threat there. It's not just there are lots of them. They're not just over there. They're over there and over there and over there. They're everywhere, all around. There's a, there's a sense of pervasive threat to David here. But he has that subjective confidence. And again, you track forward, of course, some of David's successors. King Hezekiah in the Assyrian crisis could have prayed this psalm. Perhaps he did. I rather hope he did. Claimed the promise of the covenant, lay down and slept, trusted that he would be rescued. But finally, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, is it not, who, 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 who enjoys this subjective trust. I lay down and slept. And in the end, I lay down and slept with the sleep of death, confident that I would wake again as the Lord would sustain me. So the king, the king, the king. And then verse 7, again the king, arise, O Lord, that cry, as in the book of Numbers, when the Ark of the Covenant went out before the people, uh, the warrior God, to fight for his people. Arise, O Lord, save me, my God, cries the king. You smite my enemies on the cheek you break the teeth of the wicked. Now I take it the teeth of the wicked uh, image the wicked as being like a lion or some dangerous beast that savages you and tears your flesh. But uh, teeth also have something to do with speaking and I may be fanciful here and uh, some of the professors here may correct me quietly afterwards but um, since the worst thing these people were doing was what they were saying in verse 2, there's no salvation for God in him. God's not going to rescue him. I just wonder whether there's something there. If, you, if somebody's saying God's not going to rescue you and then their teeth get knocked out, it doesn't sound so good next time. God's not going to rescue you. So I just wonder whether there's something there. That may be completely fanciful. But David cries and he's, he's confident of final victory. The Lord Jesus, too, is confident of final victory. The king, the king, the king, the king, the king. At which point, my pious friend says, it's all very well saying the king, the king, the king, the king, the king, but where do I come in? And the answer, I think, in this psalm is in verse 8. Look at verse 8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. They said the king wouldn't be saved in verse 2. There's no salvation. But salvation does belong to the Lord. The Lord will save. In the first instance, he'll save the king. 
But because he saves the king, the blessing of God will be on the people. And I take it there, the connection is made. The king is saved. David is saved. Hezekiah is saved. And the people are rescued because their destiny is tied up with the destiny of the king. The Lord Jesus is saved. He dies to pay the penalty for sinners. He's raised. The Father raises him from the dead. And therefore, the blessing of God comes on the people. And I take it that it's verse 8 that reflects that blessing back into the experience of the whole psalm. And because the king has experienced pressure and claimed the promise and trusted the promise with assurance and, 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 and prayed for final vindication, because the king has prayed for that and the king has been saved, the people can, in, can experience all of that. And so the ecclesiological observation is this point that I was trying to make in the first lecture about the overflow, the point that Augustine makes so much, the overflow from Christ to his people. That you and I can pray verse 1, many around us. And it may not be just a personal and individual thing. We're identifying with the church of Christ. We're identifying with the persecuted church. That's a really big thing that the Psalms help us to do, to identify with the persecuted church. I may not particularly have lots and lots of enemies, but the church of Christ does worldwide. And in verses 3 and 4, the promise is ours in Christ. In Christ, all the blessings are ours. I love that um, we've been loving that um, lovely song by the group City Alight and it begins, some of you may know it, what gift of grace is Jesus our Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. I love that line. It chokes me up. There is no more for heaven now to give. He's given us Jesus as the sacrifice for sinners, as the one who's been raised from the dead and in him, all that confidence is ours. The Psalms are ours. The promises of the covenant are ours. We too may enjoy the confidence of verses 5 and 6. Pray the prayer of verse 7 in Christ. So that's the ecclesiological point. So please don't hear me as uh, suggesting that it's only Christ who can pray the Psalms. I, I think sometimes I've so emphasized Christ that I might have been heard as saying that. Um, but it's very important that it should be all ours. Martin Luther, writing on Psalm 4, uh, puts it rather beautifully. He says, Christ is the head of all saints. He's the fountain of all. He's the source of all rivers. From his fullness all have received. And as all his saints flow from Christ like rivers, so scripture um, speaks of Christ in the sense of the first source. It's first about Christ, primarily about Christ then it distributes the same sense to the rivers, that is, to his people, speaking the same words concerning the saints by way of participation in Christ. Isn't that lovely? Old-fashioned language, but it's beautiful and very profound. So there are my theological um, observ observations or, or, or points to, to mention, and they're starters, really, uh, more than anything else. Now, I want just to mention a couple of difficult issues very briefly and then give an illustration and some, uh, some um, guidance, I hope, for Psalms teachers. The two difficult issues I want just to mention, and I've tried to address them a little bit more in my book, Teaching Psalms, in, in Volume 1. The first is, what do you do with Psalms in which the psalmist prays prayers of penitence? Psalm 51, supremely, but all sorts of other places where the psalmists confess their sin. What do you do if you're suggesting that Jesus prays these um, psalms. So you think it's a puzzle, isn't it? What do you do about that, he, he who was without sin? And I think there are two possibilities. One is that Jesus doesn't pray those. And some, you know, I know a very fine uh, Old Testament scholar, a uh, friend of mine who, who, who thinks that, and that may well be right. I think myself that there's something very profound that just as Jesus submitted to a baptism of repentance from John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, no, no, you don't need repentance. And Jesus said, no, it's the right thing to do, to submit to all, to do righteousness. That in some way the shadow of our sin fell on him. And that there is some strange sense in which the one who was without sin, 
uh, but would be made sin for us in the language of 2 Corinthians 5, that in some strange and deep sense the Lord Jesus can even confess sins, even though they're not his sins. They're sins that have been made his by imputation. I think that's possible, but I may be wrong. The second difficult issue I want to, just to mention is what is normally called the psalms in which there is imprecation, the imprecatory psalms. I think it's a misuse. The Latin word means really to, to give a curse, and it's the, the psalmists never do that. They never curse the wicked. They pray to God to act in judgment on the wicked. But they're still difficult, aren't they? Psalm 109, particularly difficult. Uh, and there, there are all sorts of things to be said about that. I think, in a nutshell, the answer is that we ought to pray them in Christ and that Christ prays them and that actually every time we pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, we are in principle praying something like that. And that, that that's woefully inadequate, isn't it? That's like doing a tweet in answer to something which ought to have a three-volume book. But um, I'm going to move on. Um, let me give you an illustration which I think goes back to Augustine and I found it helpful. I've changed it a little bit. Um, uh, I, I've sometimes put it a little bit like that. Augustine had this idea of Jesus as the song leader. Did I do this yesterday? I sometimes forget what I've done. You, the, the choir? No, I didn't. That's a relief. I have increasing number of senior moments when I just forget what I've done and haven't done. And I rely on my friends to, to help me with this. So if that happens, just you know, tap me on the shoulder and say, time to retire. Um, Augustine had this beautiful picture of Jesus as the song leader leading his church in the singing of the Psalms. And so the illustration that I've developed from that is imagine you're in some great concert hall and you're sitting in the audience and I'm sitting in the audience and at the front there's a tremendous choir which is the church of Christ of previous generations and in the middle there's the Lord Jesus, the song leader, leading the choir in praise and, and, and prayer. And you're in your seat and I'm in my seat. What needs to happen for me to join the choir? And this is the job of a psalms preacher. One, I need to understand the lyrics. I need somebody to tell me what are the lyrics of the words they're singing, what do they mean? So I need the preacher to tell me what they mean. I need the preacher to, to explain the parallelism, the meaning of the words to transpose old covenant language into new covenant, uh, new covenant key. I need to get the lyrics first or I can't join the choir. Second, I need to be taught the tune, and I mean the tune metaphorically. I mean the tune in the sense of the, the feelings, the affections, the emotions that are expressed in the psalm. I need to understand that because I'm not going to be able to sing the psalm in that sense unless I get a feel for the affections. So in Psalm 3, in verses 1 and 2, I need to feel how many are my foes. Many are rising against me as the music crescendos. Many are saying of my soul there's no salvation for God in him. And I need to feel the growing intensity of that pressure and threat. I need to get the, the tune. Three, I need to grasp what commitment will be asked of me if I join the choir. Every time you and I join in the singing or saying or praying of a psalm, a commitment is asked of us. What's needed is not just intellectual, getting the lyrics. Uh, it's not just um, affectional, getting the tune. It's volitional. It's a, it's a will thing. And I need to understand what commitment is, is, is needed from me if I'm going to join this. Because I can't just join in and sing it just for the fun of it. Yet when I sing it, I'm signing up to what's expressed in the psalm, and I need to know that. So a psalms preacher needs to do that, 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 that uh, intellectual or cognitive work with the lyrics, that affective work with the, the affections and the feelings, that volitional work with the, the commitment. And four, with apologies to Dr. Billy Graham, I need to get up out of my seat <laughs> and come to the front and join the choir. And in a sense, that's conversion. In a sense, conversion is getting up out of my seat, coming to the front and joining the choir of Jesus. I don't know whether you've found that a helpful little illustration. If it is, feel free to use it or improve it. There's no need to say you got it from me, um, but it may be useful. I got it from Augustine, although I developed it a bit. Just in closing, one or two things um, I would try to do if I was preaching a psalm. I would remember my aim, 
to promote faith in Christ, daily repentance, faith, trust, in one way or another, faith in Christ. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help myself and my hearers to, to sing the psalm. I'm going to do all the usual work with the words, the translation, the textual variants, the structure, all the stuff that you're schooled to do in seminary. You've got to do all that. I want to take time to get a feel for the psalm, to feel the music of the psalm. I want to consider the contexts of the psalm in history, if we know. In Psalm 3, we do know. Very often, we don't know in the psalms what context it is in history. If you read three commentaries and they give you four different historical contexts, it probably means we don't know, and that happens not infrequently. We need the context in the Psalter. It's not an accident that Psalm 3 comes after Psalm 2, or indeed before Psalm 4, but particularly after Psalm um, 2. So I consider the context of the psalm, and then I ask myself um, four questions. And I found these helpful questions. I asked myself, what would it have meant for David or for the original psalmist to have sung this psalm? That must be the first question, mustn't it? What would it have meant for the original psalmist to, to, to write and then sing the psalm? And then closely connected with that, I would ask, what would it mean for a later Old Covenant believer to sing the psalm? I often think of Simeon and Anna at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, who are two of my favourite characters. I want to give them Oscars for Best Supporting Actor and Best Supporter Act Supporting Actress in the Bible drama. Those lovely, I know they're in the New Testament, but they're Old Covenant believers waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And there they are, and I imagine when they had their meetings with their little group in the temple precincts, I imagine they sang psalms. I'd be surprised if they didn't. What would it have meant for them to sing uh, a, a particular psalm? And then I asked myself, what would it have meant for Jesus of Nazareth to sing this psalm in his earthly life? It's a very instructive question. Just say to yourself, Jesus of Nazareth as a growing boy and a young man in synagogue, Sabbath by Sabbath, what might it have meant for him to sing this particular psalm? The answers will differ from psalm to psalm and may not be easy to get, but it's always an instructive question. And then I ask, what will it mean now for us, the Church of Christ, to sing the psalm in Christ? You've got to get there. That's where we're going, isn't it? Thinking, what's it going to mean for us to do that? So for Psalm 3, I'm going to get something of the feeling of pressure on Christ and pressure on the Church of Christ, something of the assurance of the covenant in verses 3 and 4, because the covenant is made with our King, something of the subjective appropriation of that assurance in verses 5 and 6 and trust, something of prayer in verse 7 and confidence of final vindication, and something of thankfulness in verse 8 that all the blessings given to our King uh, one for us by our King overflow to us. There are lots of puzzles, lots of things you'll go away thinking, I'm not sure about that or I'm not sure about this. My prayer for these lectures is not that uh, anyone will go away thinking, well, now I've got the Psalms sorted, now I can do Proverbs or whatever it may be you're doing next. My prayer is that you'll go away with lots of questions and puzzles and resolve as I resolve um, to make the learning of uh, the singing and praying of the psalms a lifetime uh, task, a lifetime learning, a lifetime shaping of our prayers. Uh, let's be quiet for a moment. I'll pray. There may be a moment for one or two uh, questions. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we thank you for the Psalms, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, breathing out these Psalms to shape our lives of prayer and praise. Oh, Father, we are only beginners. Our prayers, my prayers are so misshapen, so distorted, but we pray for each one of us that gradually you would shape our praying and shape our praising and shape our thinking in line with the truth of Christ. And we ask it for his name's sake. Amen.